Thank you for listening to another episode of Remake Rewind. First episode of 2021. We're 2021. Year. I'm Mike, as always. I've got my buddy Alex with me. What's up, bud? Hey, man. Not much. Just doing a podcast. What's up with you? Doing a podcast as well, man. Tight. <laughs> this one's going to be an interesting one. I have nothing but good things to say about both of these movies. I find that very hard to believe. It's because I choose not to say anything bad. Oh, got it. Got it. You're going to spin everything to be a positive. You don't have to spin it when it's just this good. <laughs> it's not a so spin are, if it's true. We are watching, or we are already watched, but we're going to be talking about The Island of Dr. Moreau, the uh, 1970s version starring uh, Michael York, and the 1996 version starring Marlon Brando, David Thewlis, and Val Kilmer. V -v Val Kilmer, other people. Kilmer, Kilmer. I think the thing that probably dates that movie the most is um, Feruza Bach. <laughs> <laughs> I think they all and date it. a lot it. of other things. But uh, it's a very specific Brando, it. and yeah, Kilmer is a wide date, but that's a, it's, it's kind of dated. Yeah. So we'll. I've got a lot of background stuff on on the '90s version, but uh, have you seen either of these before? I saw the original one. At some point in the 90s. I probably saw it when it came out. Um, so it was 96. And that's when I was just like. Devouring movies in theaters. And I was already seeing R rated movies. So. Um, I have never seen the original. And I have also seen. Um, the documentary about. The uh, the making of the 90s one. The Lost Souls. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's the one. By Richard Stanley. Mm-hmm. The original director of the 90s. Yeah, I haven't seen either of these, and I've been wanting to cover this on, on this show for a long time, and I don't know why we didn't get to it earlier. Maybe we just needed to wait until we had a, a filmmaker like you who can just say positive things about movies. That's right. And uh, get to this one, but I hadn't seen either of these. I really wanted to see the 96 one because it was uh, Batman. I was like, oh, that's Batman. I remember <laughs> seeing the trailer on TV or whatever, and... Um, didn't get to see it, and then I never saw the original. And I, I just knew once I got a little older that the '90s one was terrible, or it's known for being terrible. You've got nothing but good things to say about it, but most people say it's terrible. So I just held off watching it, and uh, it's interesting. <laughs> it is. It is a fantastic movie. It's a marvel that it was finished for us to watch. That's a very, very good way of putting it. So. Uh, We're lucky I, that we get I, to see it. I think we should jump into the first one. Let's and, jump in uh, head first. You want to give me a pitch, or you want me to pitch it? Um, I'll do it. I mean, right. it's it's really the same for both of them, right? It's pretty close. Um, this is a movie that's based on the H.G. Uh, Wells story about a uh, man who stumbles onto the island that uh, has been sort of taken over by this mad scientist who uh, it turns out is doing animal human hybrid experience experiments. And um, the, the conflicts on the Island come to a head and it's destroyed by the end. Yep. So one of the things I want to point out, it's just because this is how I wrote my notes for both movies. So in the book and in the first movie, at, they only say it like once in the first movie. Um, but in the book, in the first movie, they, they're called Hume Animals, the hybrids. Um, <laughs> the second movie just calls them hybrids. The I personally like the term manimals more, so I'm going to be referring to them as manimals. Seconded. Yeah, it's it just rolls off the tongue better than Hume Animals. Not that I'm going to tell H.G. Wells uh, how to, to write. I mean, he's dead, so I can't tell him how to write. Not that I would have if well, I know, could have. It's a different time. But yeah, hum hum animals. It's it's like dropping the the from the Facebook to just Facebook. It just it's sexier. Saying it's cleaner. M animals. <laughs> <laughs> I just gonna say at the top, I was very surprised at how much I actually liked the original '70s version for what it was. Watching it as a 2021 viewer, I thought it was surprisingly well shot uh, the voodoo copy that i rented was surprisingly really crisp and clear and the coloring was great 
Like, it looks like a really expensive movie, well-done movie. And it had Michael York, who was, you know, obviously big in these kind of movies with this and Logan's Run doing the kind of the weird sci-fi kind of movies. So I'm yeah, excited it, to watch Michael York. It feels like it fits right in there with, um, you know, like Planet of the Apes and Logan's Run and stuff. Those, like, 70s, um, inexpensive, very heady sci-fi. Well, high ex- concept. Yeah, inexpensive by today's standards, I guess, but... I think, uh, you know, the Planet of the Apes and these human-animal hybrids um, Manimals. were ex- maybe expensive at the time, but they, you know, it's a man in a suit. It feels very dated. Surprisingly, now, some of the, an- we'll, we'll obviously talk about the, the animals or manimals, hybrids in the newer movie, but Mutoid surprisingly, men. I thought that at least the main manimals in this one pretty close to being equal to the special effects in the in the newer one um yeah the the, the, I don't disagree. the animals in was that i don't really disagree like the animals in this one there were a lot of like generic looking ones that looked pretty much the same but like the hyena one the bull man the sayer of, of the the sayer of the law hmm. were all distinct and yeah. and i thought they looked pretty solid i was surprised at how unlike planet of the apes they look because planet of the apes looks like they're wearing plastic halloween masks but <laughs> this one i was pleasantly surprised and i i thought there was a charisma to all that like michael york is always fantastic and um uh burt lancaster's dr moreau was pretty good too uh and then there was some like i think probably the weakest performance in this original one was uh i don't have his name in front of me but whoever played montgomery who i'm just going to be calling monty as we we proceed monty <laughs> makes delicious vegan burgers here in la i i knew you would uh, give him a shout out since i said monty yeah i love monty's i might get monty's tonight they they are they impossible burger or beyond they're impossible no oh, so katrina can't have that uh yeah that's impossible a bummer as the gluten I, they're impossible as the glutens they're different and i'm glad that they both exist but i prefer impossible most of the time hmm. yeah most of those meat alternatives have have glutens this is a movie so good that we're talking about vegan meat <laughs> substitutes. All right. Well, let's get into the movie. So the movie starts with, uh, you know, three guys in a boat. You know, they're at adrift. We don't know exactly. I, I think they're, it wasn't a plane crash in this one. This was just like they got shipwrecked or whatever. Because right. this one, I think, is supposed to take place in the late 1800s, early 1900s. Because there's a point where they talk about airplanes saying that they're like working on making flying machines so this is like you know when this movie came out it took place like a hundred years prior to when the movie came out but uh i thought it was kind of funny because you see three people just kind of like being all miserable and sleeping and michael york's just covering his face and then like one guy just rolls over and like they don't check for a pulse or anything they're just like they kind of shrug and then they just pick him up and throw him out in the in the water yeah oh and he's just like, he's what? dead yeah and then two people make it to the island, Michael York, and then his uh his friend colleague. Uh, I it would have to be his, one of his underlings because he was like a engineering officer of some naval ship, and immediately a, he just yeah he's a the ship's guy. engineer, right? So immediately he leaves his friend to go explore the island, and then immediately the friend gets eaten off screen by something. We just see him scream and get dragged away from a tree, but you from. You just see his head kind of drop out of frame and there's screams and the guy's gone. And like Michael York never, uh, he, he plays, uh, Braddock is the, is the main character's name right. in this one. But Braddock never really seems to care that his friend dies. Like he asks Montgomery, like when he meets him, like, Hey, where's my friend? And he's like, ah, oh, we buried him. Well, maybe it's just like, a oh, coworker, okay. you know, maybe it's a guy that right. he didn't really like. Maybe, but still it's like, you know, if you go through a bonding experience like that, like a near death experience like that, like just to shrug off your, your coworker, your ship mate, just dying off screen. Well, you know, Braddock's a cold son of a bitch. He is. So (laughs) not long after, I don't think we need to hit every point of this movie, but not long after getting to the Island and getting kind of a, a basic rundown from Montgomery. And he doesn't know anything about the, the hybrids yet, but he sees, um, this woman maria and he's just like damn maria's hot as shit <laughs> and like she's got like, very he's just feline features i like that eventually she does but he's just like watching her and he's just like damn she's hot and like dr moreau is like 
you like that? You like her? And he's like, yeah, did she shipwreck too? And he goes, nah, I, I took her as a baby. Like, I, I got her, and, like, by the time she was 11, you could have bought her for, the, like, any man could have bought her for the price of a carton of eggs. And I'm like, what the fuck? And then he says, <laughs> it's very does casual that bother human you? trafficking. Right. And he's like, does that bother you? And, and Braddock, who's the hero of the movie, Michael York, always a good guy, is like, Nah, it doesn't bother me. I'm not a moralist. Like, he's totally for <laughs> human trafficking. It's fucking weird. Yeah, just, uh, you know, something that happens. Maybe I do it. Maybe I don't. Maybe I take part. Whatever. <laughs> it's, a, it's a part of the world. What am I going to do about it? I'm just a man. Right. Right. Um, This movie has some pretty good pacing, though. Like, he, for whatever, he, like, tries to go to explore the island. He sees some sort of creature, runs around, ends up in a cave. With like all these manimals. <laughs> Mutoid man. Oh, I can't I can't even take this movie seriously. It's what, so hard. What to you is the central message of this movie? This one doesn't have one, as far as I can tell. I could give you a central message of the newer one. I f yeah. I feel like this movie is sort of um one of these like seventies I'm trying to find a better word. It feels like like a like a haunted house or something almost. It's like that right. formula where there's there's something going on somewhere, and this guy is gonna experience it. And it doesn't matter what the message of the movie is, and we're not supposed to take away any sort of morals or anything like that. It's just uh, there's a guy experimenting on animals, and it's going to be crazy. In the second half, we're going to get some violence. We're going to get some uh, some insane animal stunts. We're going to see some see some freaks, yep. you know, and uh, and that's it. You have a good time at the movies. You go home. Yeah. The thing that I thought was interesting in both movies, um, how little the titular Dr. Moreau is in each movie. I like it. Like, in, I like it in the second one. I think that's one of its um, hmm. Uh, better parts is a uh it's <laughs> one of its better of. parts <laughs> no but i think so we'll, we'll get to it but i think the second movie is very ambitious and that's one of the things that uh, i agree keeping moreau is sort of the the shark in jaws i think is cool so and i've got or some more stuff more of a whale than jaws so <laughs> shit um so in this one the first real like scene that we get where we start to learn about what makes dr moreau tick is at a dinner and Are we skipping right over the sex scene? No, no, no. This is before the sex okay. scene. Right, right. So they're they're at dinner, and Doctor Rowe is like, "Hey, what's up, buddy? What's up, Braddock? What have you been up to? You know, right. we only have a boat that comes every two years, so you're stuck on the island for two years until the next boat comes. By the way, so he's like, "Oh, well, you know what? Maybe things will be quicker because they're now like people trying to learn how to fly, and if they're you know, we've got submarines now, so we're gonna have a lot more boats coming and going." And then Dr. Moreau's like, that's really fucking cool, but, like, I don't give a shit about machines. Tell me what we've learned about the human body in the last two years. And the guy's like, dude, I don't fucking know. Like, I've just been, like, on a boat for two years. I know so that drinking like, water is important. They've really been hammering right. that for the past couple of years. I don't know what right. said from that. So he, at one point, he, like, breaks into Dr. Moreau's office, and you see that he's, like, it, it looks like he's a German scientist in both versions. And he's got, like, he's just he's like, oh, yeah, I got kicked out of academia. He doesn't call it academia. He calls it something else. It's like academis or something like that. I got kicked out of academis for being too out there. Um, and he basically is like, yeah, I experiment on DNA. And now, granted, when H.G. Wells' book was written, they didn't know what DNA was. They didn't really – they knew something like DNA existed, but they didn't know the, the fine details. And then when this movie took place, they didn't know. So they basically described DNA without calling it DNA. And Braddock is like, that's pretty fucking cool, actually. And Dr. Moreau's like, I fucking like you, man. I'm glad you're going to be here for two years. <laughs> and then he uh, he sees something he doesn't like. Like, he sees them, oh, he sees them, like, having Maling, who is, like, one of their servants, looks like, a, has, like, a rat face. Like, overnight, he develops rat face. <laughs> I hate when that happens. Luckily, they have creams so, for that now. So, so yeah, they have, he has rat face. And he's, like, being hauled on chains and Braddock is like, I don't fucking like this. I'm going to risk my life and just go back out in the ocean with my little dinghy. And that has like a hole in it. And he's just like, well, shit, I guess I can't go out in my little dinghy. 
Yeah, and like usually you can um you can get like some top ramen and you just patch up the hole with that. <laughs> but they're on an island. Yeah, so. you have to have a file though and file it down when you right. put patch holes with and top ramen. He didn't have a file or ramen, so he's stuck. No. Nah. Ramen didn't exist for, you know, another hundred years or so. There's actually a scene in the movie where he's going around to all the different animals and he's going, Do you have any ramen? Do you have top ramen? And they're like, <laughs> What about a cup of noodles? <laughs> <laughs> a cup of noodles will do in a pinch. A lot of, a lot of so sodium. He tries to escape and Dr. Moreau, like, it's not explicitly said, but with, like, there's some, like, lingering looks. So it's, like, heavily implied that Dr. Moreau is like, I need this guy to stay on the island. And I need him to be, like, bought in. I need him to be, like, cool with me experimenting on animals. Like, Maria, go fuck him. And then, like, he just, like, well, raw dogs her. Yeah, that's one way to get his DNA. <laughs> so, yeah, he, like, raw dogs her. And... He, he literally raw dogs her. <laughs> yeah. But he, he raw cats her. So, eventually, he ends up, like, talking in the lab with Dr. Moreau. And he's like... Dude, what the fuck is with this thing? And he's like, the guy's like, that used to be a bear, but I injected it with human DNA. And I'm like, right. Like, I, I honestly think that guy was probably his shipmate experiment. Like, it, it doesn't really seem to make sense that all these people are just animals. I feel like there's got to be a combination of animals and humans that got manipulated. Yeah. The, something that felt weird to me about both these movies is that it feels like they're trying to say that these are all the uh, animals are animals that became, that were turned human or given human uh, DNA or whatever. And we, I think there's, there's definitely like animals being born. Right. But he's also, we don't see it in this one. We see it in the second one that right. the one's being born, but he's con so especially in this movie, he's converting uh, animals into humans, but right. then they are like, they are humans, but they're furry. You know what I mean? They have like the yeah. intellect and all the accumulated knowledge of a human that's been alive for 20 years. Well, at least years. one of them does because it's only, only two of them. Well, I guess technically three because you find out at the end of the movie that Maria is the most human-like. Yeah. And by, then, by the way, speaking of Maria, um, upgrading to Braddock's penis is probably much better than the cat penises she's used to. Those things are like <laughs> uh, barbed, I think. Yeah, they are. Yeah. So he, So you've got the, the sayer of the law who is the most human and it, from what we see initially because he he stands upright fairly easily he's not like hunchbacked like most of the animals are are hunchbacked and like are forced to stand up so there's like four laws like you have to stand on two legs you can't kill an animal you can't eat meat and i don't remember what the fourth one is but essentially like you have to act like a human which is weird considering like humans do eat meat and humans do kill so, but whatever. I've so the, seen the sayer of the law off the floor too. Yeah. So the sayer of the law is the most human looking. Like he just kind of has like a weird nose and like fur going around his face. But he kind of looks like that painting of Jesus that got restored terribly <laughs> a few years back in Spain, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That was a good one. And then you had Bullman, who doesn't talk much. And I don't remember the beginning of that scene. But so there's this point to get into your action scenes that you were talking about with the animals. There's a point where they're like Monty Moreau and and um, Braddock are in the cave with all the animals, and they like bring a mammal in, and they're like, "Hey, don't forget, this is like your friend and family member." And like the bull man is like, "Nah, fuck that guy. That guy's not cool. He can't hang." And then Doctor Moreau's like, "No, he's your fucking family. Like, you need to chill." And like bull man's like, "Fuck this, I'm out," and like runs out of the cave and like kind of runs into a couple people with his horns, and then fights a fucking tiger. Yeah, he really does fight a tiger, doesn't he? <laughs> he really does. So, so he's wearing like a fiberglass helmet. There's actual blood. Like he gets his face cut yeah, up because yeah. the tiger gets its jaws around his face. I read that um, he got his, yeah he got his head in the in the tiger's jaw. Yeah, and he's wearing um, a fiberglass helmet. That's the only reason why he didn't get killed. Have you seen that documentary Roar? Is that about that movie where Melanie Griffin got like fucked up? Yeah, I actually I haven't seen it. Um... I've been meaning to see it forever, but I know it's about these uh, animal wranglers in the, you know, the 70s or whatever around this time. Um, and this is just like before we have modern, you know, rules and regulations about animal stunt work. And I couldn't find any information online about this one, but it feels like it's just some Wild West shit. Like some crazy fucking people raised some tigers out on a farm and then they made a living by renting them out to these kinds of productions. Yeah. 
Because there's just, there's just animals like, running around all over the place. And it, there's tigers. It there's became lions. A fucking, there's bears. It's fucking insane. It became a bummer movie. after a while, honestly. Like a lot of these animals so, are very clearly in danger. Yeah, so like the tiger fight, you're, I'm like just flabbergasted by that. I was like, holy shit, this guy's like, they clearly padded him up and put him in a fiberglass helmet. But like he has blood running down his face. It's remorse. Yeah. Like that tiger's tooth definitely scraped that guy's face. It's a fucking tiger, man. They take your face off with one swipe of their paw. And they're not even mad at the tiger. Like the tiger should kill the guy. Yeah. Um, <laughs> like it's pretty fucked up. And it's like an extended scene too, which I guess if you get all that footage, you want to put as much of it into the film as possible. It's a good five or six minutes of this guy just like brawling with a tiger. Oh, and then the entire island hears that that's happening. Yeah. So everyone comes like running around. But um, let, he... let's just talk about that for one second. Like everybody hears a tiger fighting from across an island. <laughs> <laughs> how loud is this tiger? Pretty fucking loud. How big is this island? I mean, I wouldn't. They hear... filmed it on St. Croix, if but they tiger... made it seem like it's a much smaller island. I wouldn't hear a tiger fighting somebody in my apartment building, let alone across an island. You probably would if the tiger was actually pissed. Tigers are pretty loud when they roar. I don't know, man. I think there's a lot of animals there, and if you come running every time one of them meows, uh, you, can, you don't get anything done. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, yeah, he fights a fucking tiger. He ends up killing the tiger, but he's like gravely injured and um everyone's like dr moreau's like well he fucking broke the laws like he needs to be punished and they're gonna take him to the house of pain which i, I think <laughs> is the lab <laughs> that was yeah that was uh one of my favorite parts of the movie was learning that house of pain got their name from this is that where they actually got it i mean it's the house of pain it's not like a common phrase so like i i'm pretty sure the house of pain is the lab they never explicitly yeah, it say is. it's the lab, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is. There's Dr. no, Rose, like, uh, contrary to popular belief, there's no jumping around in the House of Pain. You're mostly strapped <laughs> down or being, right. you know, very careful with so, hospital booties. Dr. Moreau's like, yeah, we're going to take him to the House of Pain. And then Braddock happens to stumble across the bull man. He's like, dude, I don't want to fucking go to the House of Pain. Just fucking put me out of my misery. Fucking kill me, please. And Braddock doesn't even hesitate. Just shoots bull man right in the goddamn face. <laughs> And they're like, all the animals are like, dude, fucking Braddock killed people. This isn't cool. So Dr. Moreau's like, I got you. And like, he abducts Braddock, straps him to the table, and is like, I'm going to inject you with animal DNA. The ish, And then we find out that all the animals will slowly over time become less human like and become more animalistic and start reverting back to their baser instincts. And the doctor can't figure out why. So he's hoping that if he has a human turn into an animal and then regress back into a human he can explain what was happening and maybe he can figure out how to fix it so he injects he injects uh braddock into an animal animal dna i he doesn't say what kind he, it's michael york michael york doesn't want to be in a ton of makeup so they just kind of put like they give him put him like chops <laughs> kind of thing and then they just like give him little things and like maybe a slight prosthetic nose but for the like all intents and purposes, it's just handsome British man, yeah, Michael York. He's kind of a sexy lion. Yeah. So he's just like, fight. Like, he, which, this is like the weirdest thing that I don't understand. So he's in this like animal cage for a couple of days. And Dr. Murray like gives him a basket full of rats. And he's like, come on, man. Stop being human. Be an animal. Eat these rats. <laughs> and Rat <laughs> Braddock is like, nah, I'm not going to eat these rats. What he the goes, fuck is wrong? I with remember you? everything. <laughs> Yeah, that's what he said. I'm a man. <laughs> He's like, I'm never going to do this. So somehow he gets out of the cage. I don't remember how he gets out, but he gets out and he like sees while all this is going on, like all the other manimals are like, oh, Braddock, Brad, um, Monty is like mad. He's like, did you, did you just fucking inject a human? And Dr. Moreau's like, so what if I did? And he's like, well, I'm going to fucking kill you if you did. Like, don't do that. And then Braddock turn or Monty turns his back to like close the door or something. And then Dr. Moreau just shoots him and somehow, and then dumps the dead body in the cave. And then all the manimals are like, dude, the doctor just killed a human. What it's the like, fuck is this? feels very um, animal farmy, right? Yeah. With like, I didn't animals. understand why he dumped the body in the cave though. I, I don't understand a lot about this movie. So yeah, he dumps things the body just, in the cave. Things just kind of happen. 
Right. So all the manimals are like, well, then we got to put the doctor in the house of pain. So then they're just like, fuck this. No laws. Fuck the laws. We're not going to do any laws. We're just going to be fucking animals and like fucking go wild. So they let they they appear to have killed Dr. Moreau. And they're like, well, then they stand around like John Travolta and Pulp Fiction, just kind of like shrugging, like, what do we do now? <laughs> and you, this isn't great podcasting, but both Alex and I kind of like raised our hands and turned our heads left and right and kind of like, what's going on? But yeah, they stand around for a good 10 seconds after they think they killed the doctor. And then the sayer of the law is like, dude, we fucked up. We shouldn't have done that. And then the other ones are like, yeah, fuck it. We're animals. And he's like, no, we could be better than animals. And so then Braddock walks by and sees Dr. Moreau and is like, oh, he's fucking alive. And he like holds the rifle up like he's going to bash him in. And he just screams. It's like Keanu Reeves and Point Break shooting the gun in the air. Just like, ah, I'm not going to kill you. <laughs> and then he like develop, like cuts a hole in Moreau's jacket, strings up Moreau over the gate. And is like, hey, manables, you guys didn't kill the doctor. You still have a chance to be a good guy. He did. He did the, uh, the, the fake fetch to, the, that you do to dogs. Yeah. <laughs> so he's I threw like, the ball. Got, Where'd it go? Where'd it go, boy? Yeah. I don't have it. And it's behind He's your still back. alive. And at the time, he was still alive. But, like, I mean, Moreau's like, you're a fucking animal to, like, Braddock. And Braddock's like, I'm not a fucking animal. I would have killed you if I was an animal. So he, like, strings him up over the gate. And all the animals are like, eh, he's dead. And they let all the other caged animals out. And, like, the tigers, the lions, the bears, the panthers, the cheetahs, like, systematically kill, like, all the animals. <laughs> <laughs> like, they all die. Yeah. And like the sayer of the law is like, hey guys, these are just regular animals. They're not like us. Like you could say we're animals, but we're still smarter than these ones. Like don't let these animals out. They're going to fucking kill us. And everyone's like, shut up, you fucking square. <laughs> <laughs> like, they let all the cheetahs out and shit. And they all get killed. And so like somehow a, Maria's safe. There's like, a couple of moments. Maria. There's a couple of moments in this village fire. The whole village burns down. Oh, that's right. <laughs> there's a couple of moments in the village fire that are um, really well shot moments that i thought were pretty cool um there's a I scene agree. of there's a scene of moreau uh hanging by his neck dead in the foreground it's all silhouetted in the background is just his whole village like uh the entire set is in flames it, it feels like it's actually a really big shot um so i thought that was really cool i thought that was like the best visual i thought thing that was movie. cool too i actually thought visually this movie was pretty interesting and well shot uh Meh. i thought it was for the 70s there was a lot more cinematography than i would have expected had a couple moments yeah, but somehow Maria's fine, this whole thing. Like, Braddock just is like, oh, hey, there's Maria. Let's go get on my dinghy and just go out into the, the ocean and She's just get off this island. Yeah. Ooh. Hoo -hoo. So they get in the dinghy, and then, like, Hyena Man jumps out of the water like Jason Voorhees. Yeah, that's what and... I thought of, too. <laughs> <laughs> so he jumps out, and they're, like, fighting. Like, five times. But, like, it's weird fighting, like... They're just kind of like grappling and like tumbling around. Like they're not punching each other. They're just kind of like, like boxers when they get in the corner and they're just kind of like hugging each other, but not actually fighting. And then he throws Hyena out of the boat and he's like, oh yeah, it's fine. And then Hyena pumps back up and they just stabs in the eye with an oar. Not like the point of an oar, like the entire handle of the oar just goes through this guy's face. <laughs> and then they like see a boat and it's just like, huh, huh. Michael York is like, hey, there's a fucking boat. And then he turns and looks at Maria and she has cat eyes and then like fade to black. Tight. I. It's uh, I mean, this is the smallest thing about the movie. It's pretty convenient. A boat shows up, right? Like there haven't been yeah. any like boats don't go by there. And yeah. And all of a sudden two people show two uh, outside people show up in a matter of a week. Or whatever. Now, granted, a naval ship. A British naval ship sank, so maybe people were looking for that. Maybe. I but yeah, it's it's a seventies movie. It's yeah, a seventies yeah. sci fi. Okay, I'm, I'm not down on that hill. Yeah. It was good enough. <laughs> I'm bummed that they didn't um shoot the uh, ending where she gives birth to a kitten. Yeah, I think so apparently they wanted to and Michael York vetoed it. He's like, I will not shoot that scene. Well I think the director said that uh with Don Taylor, right? Yeah, Don Taylor said yeah. that he'd never mm -hmm. seriously considered doing that. But apparently Maria, the actress who played Maria, really wanted to to do it. But Michael York said he would not have filmed that. But yeah, I can't see that being a, a serious ending. But I, I didn't hate this movie. I actually, you know, it's only like 90 minutes. It was pretty short. It was a nice little romp on a Saturday morning. 
Yeah, exactly. It's it's an afternoon at the movies. Yeah, I kind of enjoyed it. Like, I probably will never watch it again, but kind of enjoyed it. I I don't know that I enjoyed it. For what it was. But, yeah, it was fine. Yeah. All right, bud. What have you been up to? Oh, man. Somehow I wasn't prepared for that, even though you ask it every single time. I never (laughs) never have my phone in front of me ready to go. You you want me to start for once, and then you can chime in when you're ready? Um, Oh, I didn't mark off that I watched the new... Dr. Moreau. I got to do that on my letterbox. Um, let's it's see. It's not official until it's on letterbox for you. I watched, um, oh man, we haven't talked about uh, Wonder Woman 1984, have we? We we briefly touched on it on our exclusive Patreon tenant episode. Who boy, is that a movie? It's uh, awful. That's all I want to say about it. That's also on my what have I been up to, bud. Bad movie. That It's crazy that that movie, oh, and that's another human-animal hybrid movie oh yeah cheetara cheetah um yeah man that's it's it's a bummer um, it they, got worse as it went yeah and like they did things that got in their own way spoilers um but like and i know people have talked to this to death and we don't have to um dissect it but i keep on coming back to uh chris pine occupying someone else's body yeah that's fucked up and gal Gadot raping him essentially like you didn't have to do that it's a magic stone he could just appear so they like, right. went out, they went out of their way for wonder woman to physically violate somebody which is exactly why cheetah becomes cheetah like she protects right. she protects barbara uh, barbara from uh being harassed by this guy while she's walking home or whatever right and then she just kind of does the same thing she actually well, she does so, it like, instead of just harassing her and, but the difference is like so initially she looked at this guy and she's like, what the fuck? Like, why is this guy following me? And then eventually like she somehow just saw that it was Steve um, or whatever his name is. Trevor, Steve Trevor. Yeah. Steve yeah, Trevor. Steve Trevor. Um, Steve the biggest issue I had was there's a point like she didn't want to rescind her wish. And so there was a point where she was just like, well, we'll find another way. You know what? I'm going to take away the rape thing that you brought up. You're totally right that physically she raped this man. The bigger crime is the fact that, like, where did this man's consciousness go? And if they decided to, like, nope, we're just going to keep this relationship going, that's essentially murder. Like, yeah. like it's fucked up. It's a really fucked up movie. And then, like, the ending made no sense uh, just with everybody rescinding their wishes. That would never happen. But even if it did, during the wishing segment, there's no way with, at that point, there was, like, 4 billion people on Earth. That they wouldn't have like conflicting wishes, so not everybody could have their wish granted. And what about like good wishes? What if a blind man wanted to see, or some kid wished that his mom right. didn't have cancer or something? Right. So those people don't. Or get world it. But then peace. Also, like somebody would have been like some smartass, some like teenager would have been like, "I really wish this fucker would get off the TV." Yeah. And then what happens then? I know it's ridiculous. And also, yeah. like, do you? What about places that don't speak English? Is it? They show other countries, but. When it only apply to you know the U.S. and a few other places uh, that have a lot of English. No, speakers. everybody speaks English in the '80s. Yeah, and then also you know Gal Gadot uh, being in a movie where she's rescuing children from bombs falling in the Middle East, and uh, some some country. Um, I, I didn't. Un- I really understand. I mean, I understand what happened in that scene, but I don't understand why it was in the movie. But the, uh, it was a bad movie. Yeah, the was it Egypt or something? It's like, well, my people have a claim to this land, so I want everyone else to leave. I don't know. Yeah. I don't know Gal Gadot. I think maybe just uh, maybe just avoid that kind of topic. Yeah. In your Hollywood blockbuster. Yeah. Well, especially her. But I guess no She's, one's talking about it. So. Well, a lot of people did in the first movie. Like this, the, her, the first movie got like banned in some um, Islamic countries because she's Israeli. Mm-hmm. And she has said some well, things in the past, but now, granted, her upbringing—it's not just that she's Israeli; it's that she has recently talked about um, yeah. just, or she's kind of justified bombings that yeah, took place she, where children died. Yeah, yeah, she's terrible for that. I anyway, agree. Um, we but watched yeah. the Dark Knight trilogy; that was good. Oh, good. That's fun. I rewatched Bill and Ted Face the Music. I want to watch that again. Yeah, man. It's just how was it the second? It's just time? fun. Uh, yeah. Still good. Cool. Okay. Um, Samara Weaving uh, prompted me to finally watch Ready or Not, which is fantastic. 
Oh, that movie's so good. I saw that in theaters. I fucking love that movie. I didn't know it was her. For some I thought it was Margot Robbie until I got in the theater. Because in the trailer, she looks exactly like Margot Robbie. Yeah. Um, I watched the uh, uh, Green Day making of documentary about the trilogy of records they did. Nice. Um, You got to that one. You mentioned you were going to do that a few weeks back. Yeah, yeah. Quattro was really well done. Um, I want to shout out the director, uh, Tim Wheeler. Nice. Good job, Tim. Um, watched Beer Fest. Surprisingly I hate fun that movie. I I put it on for like twenty minutes and I had to turn it off because it was it felt so bad. And then I came back to it a little bit later and actually had a good time with it. Um, I was also I worked at the theater when that came out, so I was oversaturated with that movie. I was also pleasantly surprised by Murder Mystery with uh, Adam Sandler and Jennifer Aniston. I've heard that's good. It was really fun. I just don't like Adam. Sandler. I don't want to support him because of a lot of the things that he's done. What did he kill lately? somebody? Like, well, so he's he said some pretty fucked up shit about like Native Americans and like how he treated Native Americans on his set for the Ridiculous Six. Oh, that's bad. Um, so he really turned me off on that. And then he also, when he didn't get his Oscar nomination for Uncut Gems, um, he he pretty much threw a fit and said, I will never do a dramatic movie again if I don't get a nomination. I'm paraphrasing, but that's pretty much what he said. He, I feel um, like I remember he he, get a nomination. I feel like I remember hearing about that and it came off to me like he was joking. But either way, it's it's just not a professional thing. Actually, you and I spoke about this on air at one point, and you, we both kind of said, like, did you have enough clout that you can make any movie? Like, find your dream director, find your dream writer, you have a production company make that movie but don't be like well i'm not going to make these like make the movie you want and you'll probably will get the oscar nom if you go through and write produce direct it or what and star in it like you'll you'll get your fucking nomination yeah. like that was it but it feels like he's at a level where it's like why do you care what other people think if you want to make a dramatic right. movie you make a dramatic movie yeah i agree 100 percent. yeah fuck adam sandler adam yeah. sandler is our first celebrity that is blacklisted from this podcast i'm not gonna say that she's not I'm blacklisted but uh, he's brown. Funny that you you mentioned blacklisting because there is an actor that I kind of blacklisted for a while, but I did go back to one of his movies for uh, my what have I been up to? But but I uh, I went back and after watching Tenant, you and I kind of talked about how Inception did a lot of things that Tenant tried to do better. So uh, I went back and watched Inception. I had to watch another Christopher Nolan movie, so I did that, and then. We've we've talked about it a couple times over the last few weeks how Christopher Nolan and Edgar Wright kind of go back and forth between my kind of contemporary favorite directors. Mm -hmm. So I decided to watch uh, an Edgar Wright movie. So I watched Baby Driver, which yeah. has Kevin Spacey in it, and uh, Hello. And fucking hate Kevin Spacey, but he's so fucking good. Ansel Elgort's not a great. Uh, no, I've heard. Some, I I don't know exactly what happened with him, but I heard some things. That he's not so good. This is just a TMZ podcast now. We just talk about yeah. rumors. Um, God, God I, I know the whole point of Baby Driver is like how much that movie syncs up with the music. And I noticed it when I watched it, you know, however many times I watched it a few years back. But it is so fucking good how the action is perfectly synced with the beats of the music. Yeah. It's a fucking great movie. Yeah, uh, it's I a lot of that. Fun. I like it. Um, and I'm just gonna shotgun my the Christmas movies I watched because um, it was oh, Christmas I, I, before I we skipped a bunch one. of mine. Oh well, well, and, well, well, I'm gonna shotgun my Christmas movies. You'll you'll name a couple, and then I'll have right. like one or two other things. All so, right. um, Anna and the Apocalypse, the music, the British musical with zombies and shit around Christmas time. Never saw that. Uh, Christmas Story, Elf, Die Hard. Watched Elf. Watched Die Hard. Also, nice. um, Little Nicky. Yeah, you were telling me you watched Little Nicky and that it held up, surprisingly. Uh, I gave it one and a half stars. I don't know that I said it. Oh, up. maybe it wasn't you. Oh, no, it was my buddy Dustin, other, you know, former host of the show. That's he watched it, like, anymore. within the last two weeks. Was that? Yeah, no. <laughs> it's actually because he had a baby. Uh, that's even worse. Well, his wife had a baby. Oh, good. He's, he didn't, didn't have a manimal hybrid no, child. No. I also watched Disaster uh, Artist. Rewatch. That's such a good movie. I've been wanting to rewatch that. Yeah, it's fantastic. Anything else? Uh, not another teen movie. Um, Chris Evans. Yeah, super fun. Nice. I, I rang in the new year with Super Bad. I watched Super Bad probably like a month, month and a half ago. Fuck Still yeah. good. I liked it. I had fun with it. Um, I think that's kind of it. I did say I watched Office Christmas Party a couple weeks ago. Yeah, you said that on the last one, the last episode you mentioned. All right. That's everything then. 
Nice. Um, so I watched all of uh, Letterkenny season nine. It's fucking fantastic. People keep um, on telling me to watch that. Seasons one through six are fantastic. Like those all dropped at once, like two years ago on Hulu. Mm -hmm. Season seven and eight dropped like two months apart from each other last year, and they're only okay. Um, but season nine that dropped the day after Christmas was fucking fantastic. Like every episode was great. So yes. I enjoyed that. And I, I read Dune. Oh. Since the movie didn't come out. <laughs> That's a big one. I love that book. It's literally a large it's like book. The, it's it's like the fourth or fifth time I've read it. It's good. Oh wow. That's cool. Yeah. Liked it. All right. Let's do the do the do the second one. Yeah. All right. Pitch All right. me on why a remake should happen. All right. We've got this like up and coming director, Richard Stanley. He spent four years developing this movie. We're going to actually undercut him and actually try to get Roman Polanski to do the movie. But we're going to tell Richard Stanley he can do this movie. Uh, we're going to get, we got Marlon Brando is interested in this. We got Val, Valium Kilmer, fresh off of Batman, wanting to do this movie. Sweet. We've got Stan Winston wanting to do the special effects on this movie. It's a fucking slam dunk, bro. Let's make this movie. Well, yeah, I mean, it sounds like how could this possibly fail? All right. So do you want to talk about the development of this movie before we talk about the movie or after? Because <laughs> um, I think it'll like maybe I kind of want to do it first because it'll explain okay. some of the bananas, but I'm cool doing it after as well. Uh, I mean, I was thinking we could intersperse. Okay. So I'll give an intro and then I guess throughout we can pepper in a couple of things. So Richard Stanley, who... I'm gonna admit I've never seen any of his movies. I know he he's one of those directors you either fucking love him or you fucking hate him. Like there's no in between. Like his movies are very ambitious, very wild, very out there. But I've always heard that they're if you like his movies, they're fantastic and how he always does creative shit. Like I know he did that Nicolas Cage movie about color in late twenty nineteen. Color out of space, yeah. Color out of space, yep. So I haven't his, seen it, but I know he, a lot of people who like it and I know a lot of people who hate it. Yeah, his uh, feature film filmography um, is Hardware, Dust Devil, Brave, which is a long-form music video, and then this, which he is not credited as director, um, and then he didn't do anything for seven, six years, uh, Bakshu the Myth, uh, The Abandoned, Imagine Mortis, uh, Replace, and then Cover Color Out of Space. I have yeah. not seen any of these movies. I haven't seen any of them either. So... He spent four years developing this project and pitched it to New Line Cinema. Um, he pitched um, some actor as the lead role, some European actor, and New Line Cinema was like, no, we don't know him. So then eventually um, New Line Cinema was like, well, what about Marlon Brando? And Stanley's like, yeah, that's fine. Um, so eventually what ended up happening is New Line Cinema was like, we don't know if we trust Stanley with this. So they tried to go beyond behind his back and get Roman Polanski which is funny because this is our little interspersing it's funny that they don't trust Stanley um handling a star of the magnitude of Marlon Brando I'm doing air quotes because Marlon Brando is the one who uh is unpredictable and is just going to do whatever yeah. he wants like if you're worried about yeah. not controlling somebody don't cast Marlon Brando in the 90s you're right so they find Stanley finds out and is like, this is bullshit. So he he gets a meeting with Marlon Brando. Marlon Brando is like sympathetic. And I was like, I got you, man. And so he goes to New Line Cinemas and Marlon Brando's like, Richard Stanley's the director of this movie. And New Line Cinema is like, okay, cool. So there's a whole bunch of casting things. At one point it was supposed to be uh Bruce Willis was gonna be the lead. For a long um, time. James Woods was supposed to be Montgomery, and then uh 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 this is where it's a little weird and people kind of take some of this with a grain of salt. Bruce Willis dropped out. This movie came out in 96 Stanley in his, his documentary about this movie said, Oh, it was because he was going, getting divorced from Demi Moore, but that didn't happen for, they announced it two years later. And then the divorce didn't actually happen until 2000. So four years later. So people are like, eh, that doesn't make sense. So he dropped out. They got Val Kilmer in the lead role. Val Kilmer is like fresh off of Batman, but really wanted to work with Marlon Brando. It was like, cool, I'll do this, but I can only work about 40% of the time. So you need to figure out how to make this work. So they're it's like, you know what, never diva. mind. Yeah. 
So they're like, we're not going to have you be this, but what if you're Montgomery? There's actually a little bit more you can do with Montgomery. He's mysterious. So they convinced Val Kilmer to take like a lesser role. So I only have good things to say about this movie. I will say I like Val Kilmer being this fucking weirdo Montgomery. He makes some good, interesting choices. Yeah, he gets weirder and weirder as the movie goes on. And I don't know, kind of that that uh, execution aside, I think that idea makes sense and works to a certain Absolutely. extent. So they convince Val Kilmer to step down. Uh, so Rob Morrow is cast. He was the person who replaced James Woods as Montgomery. So Northern th- exposure. Three and, a half, three and a half days of shooting. And it was a nightmare. Morrow called New Line Cinema and was like, fuck this. Get me out of this. I don't care what it takes. I don't care if I owe you money. I want out of this movie. And he was like crying. New Line Cinema was like, cool. So they had to shut down production for a couple of weeks. They eventually got David Thewlis in. Aris the God it, of War. Yep. And uh, Professor Lupin. Uh, <laughs> they fired uh, via fax. They fired Richard Stanley on day four. Took a couple of weeks off. And got things going in. After All the meanwhile, he worked for four years in pre-production on the movie. This movie. So some of the other shit, and it'll explain a lot of stuff that happens. Val Kilmer was going through a divorce. He found out he was already on the island getting ready for this role when he found out his wife was going to divorce him. Which is why Bruce Willis apparently left the movie too. Now he didn't divorce Demi Moore for two years after this movie, but that was four the more years given. after this movie. He announced it two years later, but it happened four years later. Right. So, so weird, a little foggy, but lots of divorce going around. Right. So Val Kilmer, the Marlon Brando's daughter committed suicide yeah. weeks before this. And they That's had sad. no idea if he was going to show up because he has like a private Island. Uh, was it weeks before? Like I thought a, it was during filming. No, it was just before is what I read. But a lot of this stuff is like murky. Like oh, yeah, people right. are right. giving it. Yeah. So they weren't sure if he was going to show up or not. So. Now we get into the movie and we'll, we'll intersperse some other fucking banana shit while this is going. <laughs> That's just like the tip of the iceberg. Like the shit gets weirder and weirder as the movie goes. So this one has like the most stock footage opening credits that I've ever seen. So I watched something today that uh, my, uh, my friend Spence shared on his Twitter um, the, I guess it's just like a clip of the show Sherlock going around with Benedict Cumberbatch. And mm-hmm. it's a scene where, you know how like in Iron Man 2, Tony Stark, like you're looking at me, but the podcast audience is, but he's kind of doing this where he's controlling mm-hmm. a computer screen. So yeah. I guess there's a scene in Sherlock where Benedict Cumberbatch does that. And he's like, you know, he's process. It's not on a computer screen, but that's like how he's. Uh, he's in his mind palace. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he's got like the word liberty and it's like flying around and he's controlling it with his hands and he's like putting things together and figuring out these like mental puzzles and stuff. And it's just like on Photoshop, like someone just, you know, dropped in like the first font that they saw and just put the word in front of his face and then like it swipes to the side like he's on, you know, yeah. dictionary Tinder. And there's a couple moments where like they put somebody else's face on his face um, and that's how the title cards of this movie are. It's just like a bunch of like stock footage of like cells swimming in a Petri dish and like a man's colon. The same shot of a man's colon is shown over and over and over again. It's fucking it looks, weird. It looks like the, uh, the flyers that I made for my band in 2002 when I had no, uh, no Photoshop graphic design training whatsoever. Yeah. It's, it looks very amateur. So it that starts with amateur. Um, David Thewlis, uh, David Thewlis plays, um, Douglas. Uh, Th- I don't think Thulis. we get a first name. Th- 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 Thwellis. Thulis. 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 Professor Lupin starts narrating the <laughs> movie. The God He's of like, uh, my plane crashed and, uh, there were three of us and, but like two of my homies were kind of fighting and These like guys eventually fight standing up on a raft in the ocean. That an is inflatable like... dinghy. Yeah. <laughs> this is an inflatable life raft. They're just standing up fighting on it. Yeah. <laughs> they're, like they're in so Mortal Kombat. They, like, they tumble into the water. Like one of them stabs the other, I guess. And then like they fall in the water and you just see a shark. You don't see the shark eat them. You just see a shark. And David Thewlis is like. It's like a sex scene in the 30s. It's just implied that the shark ate them. Right. So then like David Thewlis just like. It's like an acid flashback. Like you see him like 
twitching his eyes and everything waking up. You see little flashes of, of Val Kilmer and then you see flashes of like madness. a really dirty boat. Uh, but then eventually like he wakes up and he's also on a boat with Val Kilmer and Val Kilmer's like, Hey bud, you, you almost died. <laughs> and this is like, I like Val Kilmer in this moment and in this introduction because he's just like nursing this guy back to health. And Davis, David Thuellis is like, um, Hey man, are you uh, as he's putting a needle in his arm? Are you a, are you a doctor? And he goes, I'm more like a vet actually. And he's like, Oh, wait a second. He, what's, what's in this concoction you're giving me? He's like, ah, you know, a little bit of Jimi Hendrix, a little bit of this and that. And he puts his headphones on like he's, <laughs> he's a fucking maniac and he's hilarious. And I love it. But then it, we find out that he's actually was a neurosurgeon. Like he actually was a doctor. Yeah. He knows but, what he's like, doing. We find that out. Like, yeah. So yeah, he does that. And it's like super weird. And this so is the first, gives him, like, this is the first check on my Val Kilmer foreshadowing one liners, by the way. Yeah. So he like, he's like, Hey, by the way, there was a bunch of blood on the boat and david thus is like he looks guilty like i think there's a lot of things that they were planning on doing in this movie that got cut or they just never shot it because of all the production problems because there are several times in this movie where david thus is douglas like looks guilty like i honestly thought it was like implied that he killed the two other guys and that was that because he looks super guilty and then like later on like you don't see it then but later on in the movie, he has like a, a scar on his arm that it, apparently they fix. Well, so it's like it's not surprising that this guy is maybe capable of murder because this is the same creepy dude who just uh, walks up to Fruza Balk and watches her dance from five feet away for an extended yeah, period of time. Creepy. So like, and she's like weird. 20 in this and he's 50. Yeah. <laughs> so he he's like what's the dealio like where are we and Val Kilmer's like don't even trip I got an island that I like work off of um this boat's gonna take us to the island and then he's gonna take you to this other island that's a four-day trek like I'm gonna pay the guy you're cool but then they get to the island and he's like hey why don't you come on my island and use my radio and like David Thewlis is like okay cool and then like the boat just leaves and like David Thewlis doesn't like freak out or react or anything and then they just like have a they go to like the this like cage of bunnies. Like they're or they're hauling a cage of bunnies to a bigger cage of bunnies. And David Thewlis is like, I want to tend the rabbits, George. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so he's like, I had a bunny when I was a kid, but I, I killed bunnies. it on a like he this is I another moment when I where turned like, into a werewolf. And he, <laughs> he's like, I had a bunny, but he died from my neglect. Like, but he doesn't really show any kind of remorse. It's just like a matter of fact. Like so it's like heavily implied, like you're going to think that this guy's going to be super dark, but it never really pans out. But like Val Kilmer pull, holds a bunny and he like give like kind of holds the bunny closer to David Thulus and he kind of like pets the bunny and then like he holds it even closer. And so like David Thulu kisses the bunny. And then we switch to an obviously stuffed animal in Val Kilmer's hands <laughs> and he snaps its neck. Yeah. And then he's like, we're not allowed to eat meat on the island, but maybe the doctor will make an exception for you. I hope he does, because you already killed the fucking thing. I would have been happy right. eating some kale. Right. <laughs> so. This movie is, like, weirdly progressive, by the way. Like, it's implied that Moreau is, I mean, it's not implied. He says he's vegetarian, right? And then he's he also. He's vegetarian. And, then, and he makes everybody else be vegetarian. And then he's also talking about, like, climate change, too. Yeah, he talks about global warming in 1996. Yeah. He's, Al He's Gore. ahead of the time. Yeah. So the island of Dr. Gore. Goro. So like you mentioned, he sees Fafuriza Bach. Um, her name is Aisa. And I mean, that's a good he, thing. She's just, she's just like belly dancing kind of thing. And she's just staring. And she sees him and like and she's understandably. Like, she's also she jamming out. out to some like um, stock 90s uh, uh, Enya club kind of music. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. That's what Where, she's doing. Where, how is she playing that? Where are they getting it from? I don't know. How is, it, I don't how know is that it's... music reaching the island? Because I think it's just later one on, of those things. Because later on, Val Kilmer, uh, Monty, loses his mind and sort of tries to become like the next Moreau. And he has oh this God. big like animal orgy. And they're like, it's like the cave scene from the Matrix uh, Revolutions. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't even know if there's actually music there or if it's like in her head because like you never see her like the music. She doesn't hit like a speaker or anything when she runs away. Non like she just like runs away. Was that? Non-diegetic. Sure. That's a filmmaking term. We're an educational yeah. podcast. 
<laughs> so she like understandably runs away and then uh monty is like hey douglas let me show you your room it's a pretty sick room and like he walks in and he's like, like douglas is like yeah actually this is a pretty nice room thanks bud and then like locks him in like monty just locks him in david lewis is like what the fuck are you doing and monty's like don't even trip bro it's for your own protection it's for your own protection so then he like breaks out yeah moments later he gets like, out very easily this is like the first 10 15 minutes of the movie like this one rips initially like it's a good 30 minutes or so before like manimals are confirmed in the original movie this is like 10 minutes in and he just like walks out into the lab and he sees like manimals helping another manimal give birth to a little manimal in in all seriousness i think the uh this like dear woman giving birth scene is very effective i think so too i saw that and i was like this movie doesn't suck entirely this is kind of no it takes some big swings and i think with like a a better direct we'll, we'll get to that when we yeah. sum it up but like I, I agree with you like that was like a kind of terrifying scene if i saw that i'd be like what the fuck so he panics and like just starts running around and this is where i kind of think that this one it's it's not just human animals that he's experimenting on he's experimenting on humans because you see like crashed airplanes and like boat parts and all this like shit that they that just and washed up radioactive on waste that they don't address right and so he's like, he's like running around and he's just seeing like all these like humanoid animals, like living in like a little village and he's like freaking out. And then like, they're kind of freaked out cause they see this human running around, like being freaked out. So he freaks out even more because he sees animals freaking out. So Aisa's like, dude, chill, come with me. We're going to find like the sayer of the law. He'll explain what's what. And then like, everyone's like freaking out with David Thulu's cause he's like all manic. And so... <laughs> I don't even know how to explain this. Dr. Moreau shows up completely covered in like mayonnaise. It's supposed to be like some sunscreen concoction that he makes. He calls it his medicine. But he shows up with like the world's smallest man with him. Um, and this was like another weird thing. So apparently so there was a point. This, Go ahead. I mean, just for people who haven't seen it, it's Vern Troyer's mini me. It's the inspiration for that. It is a mini exactly. Marlon Brando. So it's but like this played little completely straight, like it's not a joke. Yeah, well, it's it's this little man. They have fun with who, it. But it's meant to be. Yeah, it's this little thing. man. He's it's the world's smallest man, the real world's smallest man. Marlon Brando's like, I want to hire this man, and it's kind of fucked up. Like they hire this person and use him as a prop, essentially. I mean, I think this guy, he's he's a rational thinking adult. I think he knew what he was getting. He made into. a choice. He yeah, did. I'm not. I'm not gonna blast the production for that. I think it's much worse to use a bunch of animals and put them in danger. Um, right. No, I agree with you on that. I, I'm, give, you know? Now, we know Marlon Brando's batshit insane at this point. I'm just saying, like, for no reason other than him wanting to think it would be cool to have this, like, little sidekick. So let's let's pause it really quick. Uh, based on, you know, watching Lost Souls and the information that we have from that, um, that was, yeah, that was Marlon Brando's choice to have this guy. It was also Marlon Brando's choice to do the all-white paint, if I remember correctly. <laughs> Um, yeah, I think he, really I think he just showed up to the sun. I think he just showed up like that. And he was like, this is yep. how we're doing this scene. So those are two huge choices. And I think you they're know, fucking great. Like, yeah, honestly, Moreau's well, out of his so mind. I, I love it. I hadn't seen this movie before. And I heard about the, the, the sunscreen thing. And I thought that was going to be stupid, but I think that's honestly when he's taking it off, like he has like the little mini me yeah. taking it off and he's wiping it off well, as he's explaining the Island. I actually thought it was a pretty effective scene. Yeah, I agree. He's, he uh, does like a whole scene where, you know, we kind of, we kind of get this like shocking introduction to him in the white paint outside and stuff. And, um, he has to keep the, I think he has to keep the animals from killing David Thewlis or something. Yeah. So he comes and out then, on this like cart with speakers and his voice is just like, it's like the wizard of Oz, like yeah. booming voice. And, he's yeah, and it's just this like, like big crazy scene. And then afterwards we yeah. have this like more calm scene where things are sort of explained a little bit and we get to see like a different side of this guy. And he does the whole scene with like half the makeup on. And yeah. uh, I think it's really visually effective and cool. Yeah, I thought so too. I thought that was a really effective scene. It also is like a plot device to get the main character a gun because it comes into play later. Um, so Monty shows up and starts like pointing the gun at David Lewis for some reason. By the and... way, sorry, let's pause right there really quick. Uh, Montgomery's aesthetic in this movie is another uh, element of Val Kilmer sort of being this like um 
I don't know, hippie version of this guy, this like neo hippie. Uh, yeah, I thought he was fucking cool, man. He's got like big, like women's glasses, like big flamboyant glasses. He's wearing like a wrap skirt half the time. He's always got um, headphones around his neck. He's got like Hawaiian floral print. Um, He's got a compression vacation sleeve. shirts. He's got a compression sleeve. I, like I have a lot of those things, and I kind of want a wrap skirt now. Like his, <laughs> I'm really vibing with his aesthetic. He. he he makes some wild swings, and I I don't think the Val Kilmer stuff is bad. Honestly, I I think Val Kilmer is like one of the strong points of this movie. Like, and it's just so everyone knows, it turns out like the entire cast and crew hated Val Kilmer. I mean, like everyone's. I think that's a like, constant on everything he works on. Yeah, so apparently everybody hated him to the point where once they they ended up reconfiguring st- shit again because they like it's like I can only work forty percent of the time that you guys re- wanted me. Well, they reconfigured it because. Marlon Brando and Val Kilmer fucking hated each other. And they had like dick off contests where both would refuse to leave their trailer until the other did. So there were points where the actors would have to show up at 3 a.m. to get their makeup on all the the animals. And then they would end up not working because neither Val Kilmer or uh, Marlon Brando would leave their trailer. Yeah. And Richard Stanley was the issue there. Yeah. So, yeah, exactly. So eventually got to the point where they reconfigured the shooting schedule again. So the way, that way the uh, new director, um, Frankenheimer, was like, I don't want to deal with Val Kilmer anymore. So they figured all that shit out. They got Val Kilmer wrapped. And he said, get that bastard off my set. And they had security, like, take Val Kilmer to his trailer, get his shit packed. And then they got him off the island. And then he went and filmed The Saint. <laughs> yep. So... Yeah, it's fucking weird. So they, they, there's this weird scene. It's really contrived, but like Val Kilmer was like pointing a gun at David Thulis's character, and David Thulis is like freaking out. Like, dude, what the fuck's going on? Um, Doctor Moreau has like a necklace with like a full on like keypad on it, and he like types in little codes, and then it like triggers a, like a shocking mechanism in the animals. Um, and then he tells uh, uh, Monty like, "Hey, Monty, give Douglas the gun. It'll make him feel safer. He'll be more calm, and he won't feel." Like he's in danger and like the animals won't feel as threatened. Give him the gun. And Monty's like, are you fucking kidding? He's like, just give him the fucking gun. So now the main character has a gun. That's what I feel like this whole thing was like, well, we need to find a way to get this guy to have a gun. So. Meanwhile, there's like AK 47s all over the Island. Right. So the movie kind of rips from here. So we go into dinner, we have a very similar thing where he explains all the stuff. We already talked about the makeup being removed. He's introduced to like the four kids, four kids in quotation. So one is Aisa, who's the most human. Then there's like Maling who is like set up to be like their servant. And he's mostly human. that has got like a little bit of a rat face. Um, then there was Az- Azazella who's played by um, uh, Tamora Morrison, Boba Fett himself. <laughs> and, He's he kind of looks like a Uruguay from Lord of the Rings, and then there was a fourth one. I don't know. So they have the dinner. They have the little scene like you mentioned. Mini me is based off this like the little guys on like a little tiny piano on top of Marlon Brando's regular size piano. I fucking love that scene. That's <laughs> it's awesome. Weird. It's the, so he's he's got a tiny little piano on top of Marlon Brando's piano. And they're playing a duet, and they just play six. a duet, and it's like a a two three minute scene. It's fucking incredible. I think that's awesome. Yeah, so they have their dinner, and then the while they're at dinner, like somebody brings like a dead um, rabbit, and they're like, "Dude, there's a dead rabbit! Like, who did this?" And then like everyone's like, "Oh, it was Lo Mai. Lo Mai totally ate this rabbit." And then uh, Doctor Moore's like, "Well, we're gonna have a fucking trial." It's a it's the cooked rabbit, right? And they don't just bring well, in a dead rabbit like it's been. Oh yeah, so they bring in the cooked rabbit, but then somebody mentions they found a dead rabbit on the island as well because we saw while like David Thulu was running around, we saw. A creature eating something yeah and so everyone's like oh we're gonna have a a, a, a trial so while they're having the trial Azazella just walks up and shoots the guy well they're having the trial and marlon brando goes over and says that he forgives whoever what is it hyena or whatever the leopard lomai lomai uh marlon brando says i forgive him and it feels like there's gonna be you know 
uh, the next line is going to be like, he's going to go out and work in the forest for a little bit and think about what he's done. And then we're going to welcome him back with open arms because we're a society where people right. can make mistakes and be forgiven. But instead of that, his son goes up and just shoots him in the head. And everyone is yep. like, oh, fuck. And, yeah. I, and I was like, oh, fuck. And I thought that was another yeah, really too. effective scene. That really worked on yeah. me. Yeah, I was like, but then like nothing really happens. They're just he's like, go to your room. We'll figure this shit out. Like he's gonna be punished. We're gonna bury Lomai with like full honors, <laughs> like of. and everything. Like sort of, they go and burn him. Yeah. And then like Azazello is like sniffing the air the whole time. He's just like mm, barbecue. <laughs> <laughs> but then he finds. Uh, then there's hyena man. And this is the other thing that's weird. Almost all the animal creatures in this have names, except for hyena swine who yeah. is set up to be like the villain of the rest of the movie so hyena swine like finds a transmitter in like the bone of the uh, of lomai and he's like well this is weird he's so a he, leopard, like rips his way. own he was a leopard. yeah the lomai was a leopard yeah yeah so he rips the like tracker out of his or the tracker slash like pain module out of his um body and it's weird because it looks like he ripped it out of his neck but the bone that we saw that had it looked like a, a like a forearm or something or a leg when well he goes to the he goes to the furnace where the body's burned and he sort of just pulls it out of the rack or out of the ashes and he's like oh i don't know how he makes this connection but he's like oh there's there's, there's a thing in here there must be something inside of me um and then it looks like to me it looks like he's feeling around his ribs or his chest i thought that's where he pulled okay that from. that makes oh so that was a rib then because i thought it was like an arm because of like how long the bone was and then Later on, when we get like the medical records for for David Thewlis's character with that scar, I thought that maybe. So I, what I thought the twist was going to be was that David Thewlis was actually a manimal or like an animal that got turned human, and like they took that thing out of him when they sent him out to see if he can like live and be like a real man, and then they orchestrated the plane crash or whatever. Like I thought that was going to be the big twist is yeah. that. Um, it wasn't that I think that probably was what it was intended to be. And then for all the production val issues, they, they changed it because at this point, the movie just kind of rips like Douglas at the same time, like a bunch of things are happening concurrently. Like Douglas tries to sneak away and like try the radio for help. And then hyena, hyena swine <laughs> shows up to talk to Monty and Monty like tries to like shock him. And the guy's like, I feel no pain, bitch. And like, <laughs> Um, so they like fire guns and scare them off. And then, so Monty like sends like a pack of like hyena trackers to follow this guy and off screen, like hyena swine, like convinces them to like join him and like rip out their tracker thing. Yeah. It feels very similar to the first movie where it's just like, things happen, things happen, things happen. Yeah. So then all of a sudden they like. Monty shows up at the radio and is like, dude, I fucking destroyed this radio. What the fuck are you doing here, Douglas? You fucking idiot. You fucking moron. You th th we brought you to this island, you dumb <laughs> shit. And so, and then at the same time, Aisa is going to Dr. Moreau and she's like, hey, my ears are getting a little long. My teeth are getting a little long. I've got a little bit of a cat nose. I'm regressing. Like, you said you're going to make this serum for me, dad. Where the fuck is the serum? And she, he's like, don't worry. I'm really close. Do David Thulu's character is going to help me. You're gonna you're gonna be a human again. You just gotta Don't fuck him trip. Again. Right. It's more so, that sweet human DNA in you. And at this point, this is the weird part. So he's wearing a metal bucket, like a, a, and it's filled <laughs> with ice. And he did this and he refused to shoot unless he could have this bucket of ice on his head. And he said that the reason he needed to do this was it turns out that <laughs> Dr. Moreau was actually a dolphin human hybrid, and that was needed to cover <laughs> the blowhole. Never mind that he doesn't do it in any other other scenes. And even though the other there's a scene earlier in the movie where he's like, it's so damn hot. Like when Dr. Moreau meets Thulis, he's like, it's fucking hot. Let's go back to my house. It's too fucking hot out here. Like the scene where he's the, he's not even talking about the heat is the scene where he's wearing the bucket on his head because as an actor, he was hot. It's fucking weird. Yeah. And uh, Richard Stanley was the wild card here that they needed to. Uh, <laughs> so... Immediately after that scene ends with him talking to to um, Aisa, like Hyena Swine and his crew, which once again off screen decided to become buddies. They've unionized. And rip out, they rip out all their 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 pain receptor things, um, and they start playing piano. And like Doctor Moreau's like, "Oh, hey guys, playing a little bit of piano." 
that's cool. Let me let me teach you. And he like does a little like bars of a couple different styles of music. And... Well, listen, let me pause here to say in Brando's defense, that's more than Bean Dad did. <laughs> what a fucking dick. Fuck that guy. By the Fuck time this Bean episode Dad. comes out, that'll be old news. <laughs> so Marlon Brando's like trying to kill time. Like he like does some baseball signs to mini me and like I need my necklace kind of thing. So like mini me is like in the safe, like typing in the codes to get the little necklace. Um, and then eventually hyena swine, which once again, why the fuck is this the only character? One of the main characters is the only character without a name, but whatever. And hyena swine's like, I think there's, I don't know. You're right. I think in the original movie, there's more characters that don't have names, but. So in the original one, it's only supposed to be like two animals that talk. Like there are much more animalistic than in this one. These ones are much more human than the original one. Right. Like they have a village and they're living like they're farming and cleaning dishes and shit like that. Like it's like a medieval, like all of them are like medieval peasants. Yeah. Are all, so, of, them, are all of them like, where's he getting the human DNA? Is it just his and that's why they're his children? I don't know, dude. <laughs> they don't explain this. So who knows i'm sure val kilmer was willing to give dna because he has a fucking orgy with them later <laughs> we're getting to that hyena swine is like hey dad why do we call you dad but we're not like you and like you fucking are mean to us and like give us like little zappy zaps that's not cool <laughs> what the fuck dad and dad so like give you zappy zaps <laughs> so like while Brando was like well I'm gonna zappy zap your ass right now and he like tries to zappy zap him and like the zappy zap doesn't zap it zipped instead of zapped it zipped instead of zapped and then it zopped and like you never want it to zop that's that's the worst is when when a zap zops so if your zap zops instead of zipping then you're in trouble yep so he's just like oh yeah, no fuck and so they just like tear him apart he's dead and then they just like David that's, Thulu says that's watches. hard work. There's a lot of uh, square footage to tear. <laughs> There's a lot of mass. <laughs> Marlon Brando spent uh, several decades cultivating mass. How did he yeah, get so fat as a vegetarian? It's a shame that he never got to his uh, his ripped Mac stage. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, David veg- Thulu, by kind the of... way, vegetarians, vegans can get fat, buddy. Let me tell you. They... <laughs> we absolutely but not. Can. He could get chubby, but uh, I, I just don't feel like he could get that fat. Bread is vegan. Oh, it is technically vegan and just water and flour. Yeah, it's very vegan. And salt. And there's, I mean, I don't think in 1996 on a deserted island in the uh, Atlantic, whatever, uh, that they had, you know, Coco Bella ice cream or whatever. But... but that's my point. They say that he's been there 17 years at that point. Like, you're not gaining that much weight if you're not eating meats and you're not getting sweets and shit like that. But yeah, whatever. I mean, you're right. Another reason to maybe not cast uh, Marlon Brando in this role. Right. So, David Lewis just kind of watches this happen. And then, like, after he's dead, he's like, he fires a gun at the the crowd of the bad monster animals. <clears throat> and then it, like, just kind of, like, we see him go to like the like i says like hey like you need to go make my serum for me there's a serum in the lab so like he goes to to monty and monty's like got like a hair wrap and he's got a little bit of white makeup on and he's like using like a vocoder kind of thing to record messages as dr moreau i guess and he's just like it's super weird it's almost like he's almost sounds like a uh a, a paul rudd Jack Black and the, uh, Justin Long doing their <laughs> Beatles impressions. I, I, that's one of my notes. I liked him doing the Brando impression. I thought that was funny. He, I, I thought he probably it was very effective. It, it, it was very effective. And he's just like, I destroyed the serums. <laughs> um, sorry, I forgot to mention this earlier, but right when we find out that Hyena Swine has taken out his thing or whatever, um, there's a scene where um, Monty is giving all the other animals their medication which is just like oh, yeah, uh, essentially weird. shrooms and LSD and a bunch of other shit all put together. Just to keep them docile. But the way he's giving them their medication is putting it in his mouth and then kissing them on the lips and passing them medication. Yeah, it's fucking weird, dude. <laughs> yeah. He totally fucks these animals. <laughs> yeah. How did that animal get pregnant? They're totally fucking the animals. So, yeah. yeah. So he's just like, this, oh, shit. So then... This is the point oh, in the movie ahead. where I took a TikTok break, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> so he goes... 
to the lab. David Thewlis Douglas goes to the lab and is like looking for shit, and he finds a file on himself, and he sees like an X-ray of his like arm, and you see like there's a scratch on the bone, and he has like a scar on his forearm, and I'm like, oh, he was an animal. Like they did experiments on him. Nope, nope. They're just like, oh, we're gonna use his DNA to solve the problems. Like. And then he says something to like Monty, like he goes back to Monty and he's like, dude, what the fuck? He's like, oh yeah, we, we totally caused your plane crash. Like we wanted to get you here. We were going to use your DNA. It's like, well, what about his DNA? Like, did they, did, is he something special that's going to fix the problem? And that's why I honestly thought that he was a hybrid right. that worked. And I still think that's probably what it was. And they just, with all the maybe script they, rewrites and stuff, it got cut. Maybe that was a, a, a loose thread for a sequel. Right. So... He ends up like, well, like, well, I'm going to try to get the fuck out of here. I'm going to go find Aisa. Well, and then, like like you mentioned, the orgy. And he's just, like, <laughs> having an orgy. That's what it is, and then, right? Um, like, I'm not making that up. No. that That's that's the vibe that I got. Yeah. And so then Az- Azazella was, like, ta- he sees the hyena swine. He's like, hey, you're destroying the dock? What if I got you, like, a bunch of fucking guns? Can I hang out with you? <laughs> can I can I kick it with you guys? Which and is another like, yeah, weird scene because he he shows up and he's like threatening them. He's like, "Hey, I've got a gun," um, and then they zap him because he hasn't taken his thing out. And then immediately he's got he's like, oh, "I've got more guns that I can give you." Like, I'm I'm not trying to shoot you. I can give you some guns. Yeah, let's be let's let's be friends, guys. Yeah, and they're like, okay. Please don't. So then me. like, so so Boba Fett goes and kills Val Kilmer. He just like shoots him. And, like, everyone just leaves the dead body there. Like, you see, like, the little chair that he's in is knocked over. And, like, you see it a couple other times throughout the movie. It is chaos um, in the animal kingdom, folks. Yeah. Aessa a- and, and uh, Douglas are trying to get out. And then as they're, like, moving through, like, that palace room, um, Hyena Swine and, like, his posse are like, hey, where are you guys going? She's like, we're going to go. And then she turns more cat like. Like, she starts, like, her claws come out and she starts, like, clawing. I'm like, oh shit, she's going to fight some of them. There's literally, like, they've dubbed over domestic cat noises. Yeah. It's like, and there's no meow, transition. Meow. Just, like, all of a sudden, she's like, meow, 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 meow. <laughs> it's fucking weird. And then, like, I'm like, okay, cool. ball. like, yeah. And she's, like, jumping on people and, like, making some pretty good leaps. I'm like, oh, she's going to, like, hold them off so David Thulus can get away. It was a leap. No. Nope. nope. It doesn't happen. Like, uh, Azazello is like, hey, remember how dad used to whip the shit out of me? But he never touched you and your soft skin because you're more human. Like, fuck you. And he, like, wraps a rope around her neck and just, like, throws her off a ledge and she dies. He like, dangles like, it in front of her. her. He dangles, like, the frayed ends in front of her. He's like, hey, you want to play with this, huh, kitty? Anyway, I'm going to hang you. <laughs> so, yeah, she, you just see, like, a shadow. Like, like that was, <laughs> on that was the pretty wall. dark. Yeah. And so then, like, he captures David Thulus and he's like, He's having like this thing in front of like all them all them animals and is the this village when he is goes burning. Full Judge Dredd? Yeah, and he's just like Tell me I am the law. <laughs> I'm a god. Tell them I'm a god. And like David Thulis gets this like look in his eye. And the whole movie, like David Thulis shows like no emotion. Like he's just like I, I disagree with that. He I think he gets um pretty pissed when he realizes what's going on in the beginning and he's giving Marlon Brando or uh, Moreau a whole lot of lip. He's like you're a fucking monster. You're experimenting on these animals and blah, blah, blah. He's pretty like, um, he gets pissed. Disgusting. You're right. He does get pissed in that scene, but then he just is flat the rest of the movie. Yeah. Um, yeah. Like he just like, he lets it wash over him. He's like, okay, I'm cool with this now. <laughs> and so he, well, that's, you know, true to the, uh, the previous adaptation. So he ends up going and saying like, you are a God, but the issue, because you guys killed a God, he's like, Dr. Moreau was the God of the Island. But all of you killed him, and all of you partook of his flesh. So you guys are all gods. So who's god number one? Only one of you guys can be in charge. And he like tricks hyena swine into like killing his own dudes. With all these, AK-47s so they're having a battle. Showing up from nowhere. Yeah, eight, all of them have AK forty sevens. They're like shooting each other, and then um, Malai like notices like a spilled barrel of like gas, and so he like throws a torch on there, and like the whole building blows up. But so far, like we don't see anybody get killed in that explosion. Because like the good animals aren't allowed to to kill anybody, so like it gives them this like out where the like they all kind of start like clubbing hyena swine, but then they all back up like, hey man, we're not supposed to be killing like people. And so hyena swine just like runs into the building burning and it collapses on him. Yeah, he he's like punishing himself or something, isn't he? I think like he it was it just a wait. It, he totally does, but I feel like he was. It was just a cop out to make it where like the good animals didn't actually kill anybody. Yeah. So 
it kind of ends. <laughs> David Thewlis is like, well, I'm going to go. And like some of the animals are like, nah, don't go, bud. And then we didn't even mention that Ron Perlman's in this movie. Yeah. And apparently Neil Young as well. Uh, Neil Young was, um, I think he was Malay. Yeah. Mm. Hold on. I, I think. Look. I could I be wrong. I don't think he was. All these all these names are like, uh, I can't remember who's who. But yeah, Ron Perlman was like the. Um, the truth, the sayer of the law. The sayer of the law. And originally he did it because he wanted to work with Marlon Brando. Yeah. Um, Faruza Bach wanted to work with Marlon Brando. Like oh, most of these actors did this movie because they wanted to work with Marlon Brando. Um, so I think Marlon Brando <laughs> got a kick out of how much influence he wielded in Hollywood. And, oh, for sure he did. And that he could just like make something that'll go down in history as being fucking ridiculous. Yeah. Like, so in, in, you know, weirdly similar to Moreau, like in sort of a, a godlike way where he's like, I, I can make things happen by my own sheer force of will. And I'm going to so do it to make myself laugh. It's well known that even early on in the seventies, he was already using cue cards. That he would, didn't want to learn his lines, and he was using cue cards. In this one, he used a radio transmitter. He convinced New Line Cinemas to let him get his lines fed to him via radio, and he had like a little earwig in his ear where people could feed him lines if he didn't remember his line. Yeah. So be, those things are very susceptible to interference, and so apparently would pick up like police radio, and so there would be times where they would be filming, and he's like, there's a, there's a robbery in Worthington. And like they'd have to like call cut because he would be reading chatter from the police radio. <laughs> Jesus Christ, it's a fucking nightmare. So anyway, like all the animals are like, you should stay. And then like Paul, Ron, uh, Ron Perlman as the Sarah Law is like, nah, bro, you should go. Like we're all gonna regress. Like this isn't gonna be good. And he's like, well, I'll go to the UN. I'll get some doctors and some scientists. There's, I'm sure they can kind of figure out what Moreau was doing. And uh, Ron Perlman's like, nah, just let us fucking, like, become animals and destroy this place. It's fine. And, like, David Thule's like, okay, cool. And he just, like, goes off on his own. Yeah, and then the final shot is him, like, in this little, um... This Pontoon little, like, boat that he made. Yeah, like, makeshift raft. Like, something that, you know, the, the uh, people on Lost, the survivors on Lost, would use to try and get back to the mainland. That's what Tom Hanks tried to make in Cat... Or made in Castaway. Like... He's dead. <laughs> yeah, it's just dumb. It makes no goddamn sense. <laughs> Where are you gonna go? Uh, Stay on the island. Yeah, Ron. Fix Ron the radio. Perlman was. Yeah, right. Ron Perlman was only supposed to shoot for three weeks, but because of all of Val Kilmer's antics, they like had to like add shit for him. So he ended up getting stuck working on something for four months that he thought he was only work for three weeks on. <laughs> this is a clusterfuck of a movie. Um, another notable actor is um. Lo Mai, the leopard hybrid who who gets uh, executed accidentally, is played by uh, Mark DeCascos. Yep, from the Crow TV show. <laughs> yeah, and he was also in uh, he was <laughs> Kung Lao in Mortal Kombat Legacy. He was an Iron Chef host in the American version. And more more seriously, he was in uh, John Wick Chapter 3, and he was fantastic. He was the main villain. Yeah, he's fucking creepy in yeah. that role. I hope that he gets to be in more stuff after John Wick, because he's fucking dope. Yeah, he's good. He's always been really good. Yeah. Um, And then the movie ends. And, you know. Is we, he in Double we Dragon? We experienced that. Um, is he the other brother? He, yeah, is he, he is. the not Scott Wolf one? Yeah. <laughs> Jimmy Lee. Yeah. Excellent. <laughs> yeah this movie is weird like it's a terrible movie like the acting is atrocious in it for the most part i think val kilmer I, I i agree with you that val kilmer made some interesting choices and i think they worked for his character i think that val kilmer made interesting choices that some of them worked and some of them could have uh could have worked very effectively if they were executed a little bit differently i think uh, there's probably not really a way to defend marlon brando in this i think that he's trolling everybody um, yeah, <laughs> but, for sure. But I think that he brought some moments to the movie that made it unique that in a better movie would have been like in an alternate universe where the rest of this movie was made competently. People would be praising Marlon Brando for bringing on. Uh, I agree. The mini me guy. And um, no, I like, should, we should say his name. It's rude to not give his name. Yeah, I, I had it uh, written Nelson down. And, De La Rosa. Yes. Thank you. Um, 
I, and, like, I the agree white with paint you. and stuff. Like, there's stuff in there that is that seems cool. really effective. Like, I went in expecting to laugh at the white makeup thing, but I, I agree with you that that was a really effective scene as he's just like explaining everything. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. I think with a good, I don't want to say good director because Frankenheimer is a good director. Well, Frankenheimer's done some fucking stinkers, but I think uh, yeah, if they had let Richard Stanley stay on, it would have been a much better movie. At, le- well, at least it would have been was, one vision. His movie was apparently way darker and way more sexual. And, like, obviously those sexual undertones come through with Val Kilmer, but I think we would have saw some explicit, like, animal fucking if, if <laughs> Which, Richard Stanley got his way. Dope. Like, make that movie. In her species erotica. By the way, Frankenheimer did The Manchurian Candidate, the original one, which we've covered on this show. Uh, he also did French Connection 2, um, mm-hmm. Ronin, which is sick, and Reindeer yeah. Games, which is sick, but in a not in a different way yeah so yeah it's it's i think with the one good director this could have been well and i think even if with frankenheimer it could have been good but he clearly like hated everybody and so he like it was very obvious he rushed to get val kilmer out and if they were willing to do extra takes and really flesh out some of val kilmer's ideas i think it could have been really interesting i think it would have needed a more charismatic lead though i think there's a lot of yeah i think there's a and you know he thulis was the third person cast in this role um yeah i think there's a lot of interesting ideas going on at various stages of this production but um also kind of everything that could have gone wrong went wrong would you watch this again maybe in like 10 years yeah i i feel like i could watch this again in a few years and see like if my opinion changes and i also feel like this could be a fun party movie too just to like have people being like dude what the fuck is this and like share this with people i don't think that there's a ver. i don't think there's a world where this becomes an entertaining or coherent movie oh no i think it's um interesting in the way that we're talking about it just thinking about like oh this had gone differently and yeah, yeah exactly i think there are a lot of pieces in this that work but like there's clearly some missing puzzle pieces and things that were crammed together that weren't supposed to fit together yeah i would say instead of watching this you could just watch uh the lost souls documentary about the making of this movie i think that's a i movie. really want to now Which, i'm probably going to it's funny that it's funny that i say that because um it's similar to the apocalypse now and hearts of darkness where hearts of darkness is like kind of a more rewatchable movie Huh. Um, have you seen that? No, I haven't. Yeah. It's about the making of Apocalypse Now. Yeah. And mm-hmm. how like... How there's like 15 cuts of that movie. Not just that, but how like Francis Ford Coppola <laughs> did his own um, descent into madness the way Colonel Kurtz does. Or right. I guess um, Martin Sheen kind of does more of it. Like Colonel yeah. like Kurtz is already there. But, and that's interesting too, because um, this story is... Uh, I don't know the the... The history, but the Island of Doctor Moreau, the H.G. Wells story, is very similar to um, Hearts of, Heart of Darkness, which is what Apocalypse Now is based on. Mm-hmm. And Marlon Brando was in both of these movies. Well, and that's why Marlon Brando wanted to do it, and he he went to bat for Richard Stanley at the beginning. Yeah, it was apparently based off that conversation. Um, he really understood how Heart of Darkness related to Doctor Doctor Moreau, and, and that's why he wanted him. Yeah, and ironically, uh, Brando is in neither of the better versions of these movies. No. Lost Souls and Hearts of Darkness. Just to wrap it up with one more crazy bananas trivia about this movie. So it's not confirmed, but it's also kind of confirmed at the same time. So apparently, Richard Stanley never left the island. They couldn't find him when they were supposed to get him on a plane to Hollywood. Apparently, he was really good friends with one of the special effects guys. And it's rumored that he's in this movie pretty consistently as one of the background uh manimals and he didn't reveal himself until the rap party he was at the rap party at the rap party because val kilmer hated frankenheimer so much uh he actually apologized to to richard stanley said i wish you could have been on here um uh richard stanley got paid his full salary um if he agreed to leave and never say anything negative about this movie and marlon brando also apologized at the rap party and was like hey i would like to pay you you know a bonus for not doing this and it's heavily rumored that not just um i already forgot the other actor who 
was uh, Douglas for the first few days of this before get, before th thank you um, Morrow called New Line Cinema and like cried wanted to get out of it but it was also rumored that another actor on set called and helped get Stanley fired and it's a lot of people believe it was Val Kilmer because Val Kilmer said he apologized to Stanley at the rap party so it's there's, a fucking shit show there's an entire section in the Lost Souls documentary about uh, Richard Stanley getting fired and being given a plane ticket back to uh, the UK or wherever um, and he doesn't take the flight and just retreats into the wilderness and is potentially gonna attack the set and then ends up being Jesus on Christ. the set as an extra. It's a whole, it's like 30 minutes of the Lost Souls documentary. And I, That's insane. I just want to recommend that people go watch that because it's awesome. And the uh, one other thing, Feruza Bach, she was like team Stanley the whole way apparently. So when she found out that he was leaving, she left the set. Didn't tell anyone. She just got, she hired a, a limo driver and drove like 2,500 kilometers away. Cause I guess they were filming this in Australia parts of it. Mm. So she got in a limo, drove off. And then like her manager called and said, if you don't get back to set, New Line Cinema says they're going to bury you. Like your career's over. So she had to go back and it was like a $2,500 limo ride. Which is kind of what happened anyway. Yeah. Uh, yeah. She didn't. I mean, she had the water boy after this. And I think she the craft sure was did. after this too. <laughs> the craft was before. But, uh, was it? The yeah. craft was before? It was the same year, but before. Oh, okay. Well, Waterboy was later. She had the um, Waterboy. You know, let's just dive into this for a second. She did American History X three years later, and then Waterboy that same year, which is funny. Um, Almost Famous was two years after that. And then she, was, she, she worked pretty consistently through the 2000s, but nothing huge. Yeah. And then she's in the Craft Legacy in a cameo. Yeah, bananas movie. I'm I'm actually honestly glad that I watched this and got it off my my watch list because this is something I've been meaning to watch for for years and now I can say that I did. <laughs> yeah. Um, let's watch something really fun next time. Yeah, we'll figure it out. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> thanks for listening, uh, Alex. Please give us your plugs. Uh, I'm on Instagram at Dyslexic, D-Y-S, Alex, I-C. You can follow me on Twitter at Polishi, P-U-L-I-S-C-I. And if you want to follow along with what I'm watching, I'm on Letterboxd at Polishi as well. Honestly, follow follow him on Twitter. He's got some good tweets. We had a pretty good hey, Muppets thanks. thread going back. This is like <laughs> the second time we've had a fairly long Muppet back and forth on Twitter. Um, yeah, we're, we're trying to become producers of the uh, Muppets Great Gatsby movie that yeah. That isn't a thing, but if it is a thing, we're going to demand producer credits. The great with our, with our, yeah, the great Gonsby with uh, DJ Ryan Fresh, one yeah. of our, our our listeners. He's like a creative um, producer. I think he wants to be a line producer. Yeah. Oh, good. He could be the line producer. I mean, he was talking. Yeah, about he said he was going to work out the production budget. So, yeah. yeah, check us out on Twitter. You can check out everything that's MDX Pods related at mdxpods.com, Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, all at MDX Pods. If you want to support the show, you can go to. Uh, patreon.com slash mdx pods we have our first exclusive patreon episode with tenant uh and we're going to start doing a lot more content there and uh i need to discuss this with alex i haven't told him what i was thinking yet but i've got some other patreon ideas that i'm, I'm kind of kicking around so oh shit yeah i'm scared be on the lookout we're going to give you guys our dna no i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if it's consensual then it's fine gross uh thanks for listening thanks <laughs>